All right, guys, welcome back to PacWest Bigfoot. This is David. And if you hear anything over here to the left of me, we homeschool. <laughs> it's my wife. She's like, what are you doing? Anyways, welcome, guys. Um, this week, we've got something pretty cool uh, from, uh, I believe it happened in the state of Washington. Um, but first, real quick, I want to let you guys know that I'll be doing the uh, free giveaway next week and the announcement of the winner for May. Um, and anything else new, that one page that I wanted to get done in April, I will actually have done this month, and I'll have it done uh, by the end of next week. I just ran into a lot of like little PC issues here and there, and plus all of your guys' patience with me getting into the new you know, business that I'm doing now. Uh, new career, so thank you guys very much for all the patience there. But with that, let's get going. And Tommy, there, I'm there. Hey, David, how you doing? Hey, pretty good, pretty good. So you've got something that was kind of interesting happen to you, and what I want you to do is just kind of set us up a little bit for you know what happened, uh, what you were doing that day. You don't have to give us a specific location if you don't want, but you know, kind of an area, you know, in the state that you might have been in. Um, I know uh, right now you, you're actually from Oregon, but this was in Washington? No, this was actually, this actually happened in Oregon. Oh, in Oregon. Okay. All right. So this happened in Oregon. So why don't you just kind of lead us into what you were doing that day, heading out to do, and then what you experienced? Okay. Yeah. So um, it was mid-December and we were looking at uh, a friend of mine and I were going to get a, a Christmas tree uh you know for, for i just want to get a really nice one so I had gone to the forest service and got the tags and i think they're like five bucks and it's like really really inexpensive so um i i initially wanted to head up kind of northeast and he suggested uh, a totally different direction opposite direction so i said okay yeah we'll give that a shot and i'm glad we did it was a great area and we stopped in at the ranger station and for that district mm -hmm. and just before uh you know taking our trip up into the wilderness and stopped in there and, and talked with the uh, local uh, botanists and they actually had like an 18 foot tree and what i was looking for was the noble fir because that's 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 the iconic mm -hmm. christmas yeah tree. and they had one that like an 18 footer in there i was like wow where'd you guys get this and she told me the area and said okay all right and I was like, I think we can find it, but I purchased a what's called a quad U.S. Geological Survey, the USGS quad for that area. So it lists all the roads, and uh, so we took off up into the uh, up into the Cascades there, mm -hmm. and it took a little while actually to to find where this was. It was it's pretty deep in the wilderness. Uh, we got up there and looking to get to uh, better than a 4,000 foot elevation. So around 4,200 feet, I started seeing these things. And this friend of mine said, hey, listen, um, back in the day, years ago, he'd actually worked for the Forest Service. And I don't remember if he was he did volunteer clearing work or contract work, but he'd actually worked that very area uh, mm -hmm. earlier on in his life. So we went up to the top of this mountain and it was just perfect. Got up there, there's a little bit of snow on the heading up there and uh, found the tree that I was looking for and it was absolutely perfect. So, and you know, we're just checking out the area and as we're leaving and as we're getting ready to leave, I glanced off to the horizon and there's, uh, and you're an Oregonian, there's the three sisters Mm -hmm. broken top and a couple of minor buttes and they're snow covered and they, they they've suddenly gone from that stark white to the alpine glow was kicking them into a really nice orange rose color they're just very stunning vista um really nice so we uh, had the tree loaded up in my truck and, and I'm kind of focused on getting out of there. It's getting dark, it's getting late. And the front tires on my truck, honestly, were in a state of uh, kind of deferred maintenance. It was time for new tires. So I was a little concerned about getting through the snow, even though I had some chains. Mm -hmm. And as we're leaving, 
I had noticed a a tree break, and it was kind of iconic. It's a uh, um, there's a researcher named Will Jebney, and I have some of his books. Yes, yeah, a good friend of mine, yeah. I, I thought so. <laughs> and and uh, this guy is very knowledgeable, and his information is uh, very accurate. So it, it was something that was listed in one of his books, and he actually has a picture of it. And I looked at this thing, and it kind of caught my attention. If, and if it hadn't been so late and dark, I actually would have pulled over to see if I could follow it and maybe see if there's some other ones, which would be pretty indicative that there is, you know, this isn't just a natural occurrence. But I didn't do that because uh, I was under a bit of a time pressure. I just wanted to get out of there. Yeah. By this time, it was actually getting pretty dark. So we worked our way through uh, a whole series of switchbacks. And every time you hit one of those switchbacks, you've got a snow field that you have to kind of very slowly work your way through and get the heck out of there. And we finally got to a point that we're pretty sure that we're out of the snow level. And so we stopped the truck and get out. And now, so you got to get those chains off. And that's always a lot of fun. You climb under there. And even though you're not in the snow, it's still really cold. And I had one flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> so we're unhooking the chains and getting them out of there. And then you got to pull the truck forward a little bit so you can get the chains out. And then I got to get these brand new chains and I'm really fussing and I'm very fixated on getting them back in, unraveled, untangled and back in the bag. Yeah. As a diversion, I said, Hey, told my buddy, I go watch this. So I went over and I grabbed a stick, a real perfect stick. And, and I, there was a tree there. And I just went, fuck, fuck. It made a really nice knocking sound. And Nothing happened, which I knew it wouldn't, you know, but it was just kind of fun to do. Two or three minutes later, I'm still trying to get the chains unraveled and stowed back in the bag properly. And it's dark. And we're in an area that is, you know, underneath the canopy. The canopy top is probably a good 30, 40 feet up. But underneath, it's completely dead. It's almost a sterile environment. There's almost no understory. There's no vegetation down below. Okay. And really pretty lifeless in there. It was very thick. You know, it's a, probably a tree planting operation, you know, many years ago. Yeah. So um, as I'm trying to stow the, be- the uh, chains back in the bag, all of a sudden, we get this one loud shrieking whistle that kind of pierces. And because I was so, you know, when you get to that point where you're just very tired and you're very focused on something, Mm -hmm. I heard the whistle. It didn't really register anything. My friend who's, he's, he's worked up there. He goes, what the heck was that? Mm -hmm. That's what caught my attention. I looked at him and I saw the look on his face and I was like, man, this guy's not scared of anything. And he was, he had a look of fear in his face. And, it, and all of a sudden I realized, yeah, that was loud, very loud. It wasn't a bird. It wasn't anything. It wasn't a bugle from an elk. And he was like, oh, well, that had to be a bird. And kind of reassuring himself. I didn't say anything, but I'm like, no, there was not a bird. There's yeah. no bird that shrieks that loud. And, and, and it was completely out of place. So we finally got the, uh, the chain stowed, got him back in and headed out of there. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, worked our way back. Takes quite a while to work through all the switchbacks and, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it really bothered me that sound because I was like, what, what is that? So over, over time, I started thinking about it and uh, you know, there's just sort of a body of evidence that I was taking a look at in its totality. And it seemed, you know, it, it really seemed to support the idea that this was a Sasquatch. Uh, number one, that area that we were in has uh, has a lot of reports of that exact thing, the vocalizations, mm-hmm. sightings, 
And actually, one of them was um, one of the reports I actually listened to on your website um, some time ago, several months ago. Uh, somebody had reported that. But um, there was the interesting thing is as we were coming in to get the tree before all this happened, uh, there was a very, very large, probably 50 or 60 herd of elk down on the lower elevations mm -hmm. in somebody's cow pasture, which is, you see that, yeah. but um, it's like, wow, okay, that was, that was interesting, a whole bunch of them there. <laughs> hmm. And mid-December, I think that's just beyond the hunting season, so, you know, didn't know why they were there, but there they were. And uh, but that is a known, I think that's kind of a um, typical uh, food source, you know, for, for Sasquatch. Yeah. Also, the area was, um, uh, it's very, very heavy in, I think it has the largest stand of this particular type of wild berry in Oregon. And that's one of its uh, reputations. So, uh, and also the area that we were at is my understanding I'm just going, kind of going through some of the, like I said, the circumstantial evidence that supports mm -hmm. this being a Sasquatch is uh, they need to be near a water source. Yes. And looking at this on the top of the map, there's lakes less than a mile away, several of them, but also a lot of creeks, a lot of seasonal creeks, and some of them that are year round, a couple of bigger ones. So there's a lot of water sources nearby and uh, and the other thing that was odd, looking back on it, was when we had pulled into this kind of a dead zone to remove the chains, is there was, it was absolute silence. Now that could be attributed to the fact that it was a dead zone, um, but it was just still, absolute, yeah, very very still. Almost uh, looking back on it, it, was it was like an oppressive. Still. Well, still, even 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 in a dead zone. I mean, up in up there. I mean, you, there's there's life everywhere. <laughs> yeah, there is. And at the top of the canopy, you're going to have uh, you know any kind of canopy, whether it's a you know deciduous or or conifer forest. You're going to have a lot of. That's where all the life is. You know, the mm -hmm. birds, that sort of thing. But uh, going back, the volume. There's a loud whistle a shrieking whistle and there's i mean you know all the birds that live in the forest none of them make a sound like so it's something that i'd never heard and this friend of mine uh, apparently he'd never heard either and he'd actually like i said he'd worked in the area mm -hmm. so it was a very out of place noise that uh and uh, again like i said it was the look on his face his response to that loud piercing whistle was uh as what caught my attention it kind of shook me out of my uh yeah it was just like what in the world <laughs> it's that yeah yeah you that's know. exactly the response what whistles i'm you sorry know. go ahead I, I was saying what whistles what out there that you know of in oregon in the wild whistles yeah that's a very good question birds chirp and, and it almost, honestly, it sounded like somebody, you know, when they put their fingers in their mouth and do a loud whistle, mm -hmm. similar to that. So you're right. What, what whistles? I mean, birds make a chirping sound. And, uh, and I think that's what this friend of mine, he was like, you know, he did the proverbial WTF was that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it, and that, and that caught me. I was like, yeah, what was that? And then yeah. that's when I realized, you know, we need to hurry up and get these chains in the truck now. <laughs> I don't care about it. Like, so I'll untangle them when I get home. Just throw them in the back and let's get out of here. <laughs> um, but it was, it was, uh, and, and here's the thing. That lines up with a lot of the reports that I've heard where you'll have, maybe a watcher, mm -hmm. one of them who is signaling to the others in the group that something's going on. 
And yeah. it happened about, it, it wasn't immediate, but it was about two or three minutes after I'd done the wood knock. So and this, I, this was, again, up around the Sisters National Forest? It was actually, uh, they were, I could see the Sisters that were in the Willamette National Forest. I okay. could see them, but looking on a map, they were over 30 miles away. So we were embedded okay. um, pretty deep in the lower cascades uh, but we were west of the sisters okay oh sometimes i like to throw up the old maps here on the just to kind of give people an idea of what the the land and stuff looks like uh, yeah and like. the you know you look at the the, the uh, square miles of the Willamette national forest I, I don't know what it is off the top of my head but it's huge i mean it, it goes all the way down to southern oregon and um, and really, it's a district, so it's a kind of an arbitrary division. Uh, it really is a wilderness area that runs from yeah. Northern California all the way up into Washington and British Columbia. Well, it's a huge, huge greenway, uh, natural greenway from that standpoint. Let's see. I'm gonna put a kind of a snapshot of uh, Sisters, Oregon, up here. So people can kind of get an idea <clears throat> of what is actually out this way. Trees. Lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing um, but trees, man. That's yeah. And this particular area, you know, and you look at, look at a, um, you know, you grab your USGS uh, quad maps and uh, all of them, or a lot of them, even though it's national forest, some of them are interspersed with, uh, patches that are marked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Private. Shut that door. But you know, here's the thing. When you get a loud whistle like that, if it is a bird, a bird is a prey animal, mm -hmm. they don't respond vocally by giving their position away with a loud noise. Uh, I almost think of it like a, um, you know, if you look at it, <laughs> In the maritime world, you know, in the naval world, uh, submarines don't ping; they listen. That's all they do. They never, they never do a uh, active. Um, their their equivalent of vocalization. They don't do a sonar ping, and I've never had a situation where you make a loud noise, and then the bird two three minutes later will respond with a loud whistle. Yeah. So it really boils down to um, behavior. And this is something that Will Jevning points out uh, time and again is uh, not just the physical evidence, but really the, the crux of the whole thing is what does the behavior point to? Yeah. And so let me, why would the uh, same whistle? Yeah, let me share my screen here. And this is basically kind of up around, <clears throat> kind of just, you know, a little bit southeast actually of around the area. Yeah, uh, a very good representation. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and you got the, uh, now here, you've, I think these are a lot of, uh, looks like Google Earth. Yeah, so I think these are a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know if those are ponderosas or if those look like ponderosa to me. Yeah. 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 So we were in a, in a stand that was, uh, um, and we were, um, you know, we had mountain on one side. It was a very steep, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of in a valley. So on one side it was going, it was going down to the drainage to the uh, waterway down there. And the other mm -hmm. side was the mountain. And uh, this does, those, if you were to get in the midst of those thick trees, that's what it would be. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. And it's interesting because <laughs> some of the areas are, are uh, they, they weren't as dead as this one. But mm -hmm. this one, there was so, it was so thickly packed that, like I said, that the entire understory was pretty sparse. Yeah. And it just it's, a, it's really it's a it's a pretty it's pretty thick out this way man uh people don't understand how thick the forest can be here even here uh, there's just so many shrubs and smaller trees and everything else constantly grown it's it's thick in there 
It is. And you know what's interesting? Walk 30 feet in there. Walk 40 feet in there. Yeah, you're not going to see me. Yeah, and it's it's a it it changes dramatically. Your whole world changes. So go back in there. Two, we, we went once. Uh, me and a couple friends went up, and we were getting some morale mushrooms, and we were up by Hyatt Lake. And I knew how to get around there, uh -huh. so I knew which way. You know where if I went walk downhill from where I was, I'd end up at the creek. The creek would lead back to the little dam at the back of Hyatt Lake. That was easy. I kind of knew where I was going. You know, I you could blindfold me, stick me anywhere in Oregon, and I'll walk home. Okay, and, that's good. <laughs> but it doesn't change the fact that you can get turned around a little bit here and still find yourself off by a little little ways. And you know, me, we were we were picking these mushrooms, and the next thing you know, I I was like, oh crud, I got to get back up to the road. So I walked up to the road. And I was like, hey, where's the car? And I'm like, that car is 200 yards down around that bend. Yeah. And I yeah. walked two football fields to go get back to that car. And when I left that car originally, I walked straight off into the forest from it. You know, that's interesting because Hyatt Lake, I don't know if I've been to Hyatt Lake, but I've seen pictures of the area. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's uh, you've got some meadow and it's interspersed with tons of, you know, of different pines and conifers of different varieties. And I could see walking, like you said, you could walk 50 yards into that stuff, mm -hmm. 100 yards, turn around and go, now, hey, wait a second. <laughs> and you think you have a sense of natural direction. Um, but this is one thing that's very critical. I actually didn't do this when we went Christmas tree hunting because I knew I was going to stay on the road. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I watched a guy a while back who had the best way for getting unlost when you get lost in the woods with a compass but no map whatsoever, and it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, his tactic was take something out of your backpack or something, a jacket or whatever, or even some trees, some dead branches, whatever, but find one tree that's going to be your index, okay? And mark it with maybe a handkerchief or something. Take your compass out. You don't need a map. Yeah. And then you're going to walk. It's called the, uh, I believe it's the 30, 60, 90 rule. So you, you, you walk uh, 30 paces due north. Did you find yes. the trail or the road? No. And then you reverse it. And you do that east and west. And you, re you repeat that process. And by the time, if you're doing 90 paces, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to find out, you're going to find where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, I always thought that was a very useful um, tactic for getting unlost. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. It's always good to just kind of, yeah, kind of know, you know, know, uh, and kind of mark your, mark your spot, mark your way back. Yeah. It's always a good thing to do. You know, yeah, if we had, you know, if I had walked things like that all the time. Sure. So, yeah, if I had wandered off into uh, the brush there, it, then it would have been uh, very quickly, <laughs> you know, yeah. 50 yards in there. And, uh, you know, you could, of course, the one, the one thing I have going for me is you're either going up or down. So, you know, you just reverse that. Yeah, but the terrain is more flat, like what we're looking at here. You can get disoriented very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And actually, that to me, that's part of the um, the beauty of the whole thing is is as long as you can get 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 out of there, it's uh, that's one of the advantages I think of Oregon is we have a lot of that wilderness. That yes, you go camping and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally. I yeah. Yeah, a whistle in the woods, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I've never just... heard that. You know, I like I said, I'm I'm in my late fifties, and I've grown up in the woods my whole life, and and I've heard everything. I've heard, you know, I've camped out there where I've heard the mountain lions and mm -hmm. and uh, bugles, and I've been within, uh, you know, bugles, elk bugling, um, and I've been within ten feet of a bear when it. More than once, you know, when it made a, a, a woofing sound, it took off. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I took off the other direction. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, and, yeah. No and doubt. lots of birds. But this was, you know, birds, like I said, they chirp. And this was one loud whistle. Birds usually sing a song. 
even if it's a short one, they'll make a, uh, a series. So that's why, that's what caught this friend of mine's attention and my attention. And once I saw him, is that, Oh. Yeah, because after, I mean, it's just, it, it's, you know, to be honest, I mean, I always tell people, you've only got one thing out there that's going to whistle in the woods like that, I don't care how loud it is, or shriek, for that matter, yeah. or scream, and that's going to be people or Bigfoot. You yeah. got one of the two. I mean, there's there's really nothing else out there. You well, know? there wasn't, you know, when you say nothing else out there, that's exactly what was out there was the way into the area that we we're on. We're on a uh, national forest road. There was one way in, one way out. And it, you know, it's a kind of a stretch to even call it a two lane road. It, it's, uh, you know, I dread having some car coming up because then you got to get way over to one side and he's got to get way over to the other side. So there was no other traffic. There was zero traffic going in, zero traffic coming out. And uh, about four weeks after this incident, I went back there. Uh, he and I went back, and I had one thing on my mind. I want to find that tree break. But hey, unfortunately, hey. it had snowed substantially. So the snow level was a lot lower and a lot deeper. I tried to work my way through it, and I was like, no, nah, this isn't going to work. You know, it's getting pretty deep, and yeah. And so, but I am going to be going back to that area uh, very soon. He's he's actually out of country right now. He's overseas for a couple months, and uh, but when he gets back, uh, I think he and I are going to go back there and, and check it out. I'm going to see if, uh, I'm very, very curious about that tree break, to follow it and see if uh, there's any more evidence up there. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. So, All right. Well, <clears throat> that is that's awesome. If you if you you know when you're out there, man, you hear anything else, you you should come over and let us know, and uh, we'll sit down again and kind of go through some of the evidence. Um, are you planning on like doing any sort of I don't know, um, <coughs> like, I don't know, maybe some sort of research stuff? Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, this really piqued my interest because, <coughs> excuse me, if, uh, if it's what I think it is, and it is, I'm, I'm sure of it, then it's the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. You know, you may be out on the ocean, you just see the one little piece of ice there, but it represents a much larger reality just below the surface there. And this whistle, if it is what I think it is, uh, it represents the possibility, you know, and I guess these things move around a lot. So will they still be there? I don't know, but will they leave some physical evidence behind like uh, footprints or more tree breaks or I don't know what else, but it's, yeah, I'm definitely going back and doing some investigation. So. And I'll nice. keep you posted. Awesome. That would be great, man. And uh, uh, let's see. So you, are you part of like any like research group or research no, organization? No, not at all. Doing this I, 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 I personally have, I mean, I spent a lot of time reading up on the subject mm -hmm. and it's kind of polar opposite from, you know, my uh, livelihood. I'm not a, I don't, you know, I don't make my living outdoors, but I find this subject extremely fascinating and it becomes fascinating once you turn the corner and say, it's not that these things could exist. It's that there's almost no way they could not exist. The evidence is just too, um, and what I look for, just going back to the reasons that I came to this conclusion is I look for credible people, even credible people that have uh, something to lose by publicly stating that these things exist. And so a friend of ours, um, she's, a re uh, she's an attorney at the time, she's retired now, but she was actually a, a city attorney somewhere in the Cascades. And she called me up one day and said, hey, Tom, you need to check this out. <clears throat> and I was sort of on the fence. Mm -hmm. you know, which I think most people are. And that's where people should be on this subject. Um, 
but anyway, she called me up and said, check this out. And she sent me a link to a video of some guy. And I know you know who he is. Uh, he shall remain nameless, but he had a uh, family practice. Uh, he was a family psychologist. And yeah. so he had an encounter. <clears throat> and so I watched him. You know, he's on camera and I'm watching his facial expressions and everything about this guy said, yeah, it's absolutely, he's telling the truth. And what he saw wasn't something blurry. He actually saw it. Now he has unfortunately since, at least in my opinion, gone off in a direction that, um, uh, I, I, you know, I'm just not sure where it is, but, uh, you know, uh, it, I'm, I am with you on that one too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, um, it's, it's a very bizarre direction, but who knows? I mean, that's, if that's, what he needs uh that, okay that's great but his initial contact and he did some follow-up with a um i think a zoologist or a field biologist from africa who was now he was british but he was living in oregon and they went up to this area that where he found it and they found the physical evidence they found foot tracks and mm -hmm. areas where the thing had sat down and some bedding areas um, so it wasn't just, uh, you know, you know, it was hard, tangible evidence. Evidence, that, yeah. That that wasn't anything else. You know, footprints. You know, size thirty six shoe or <laughs> size thirty six foot. You know, <laughs> I'm I'm exaggerating, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, uh, and that was, you know, this guy was a professional, and he was putting his professional reputation on the line. The gal who contacted me and she's a friend of ours and she's a an attorney and she was not exactly putting her reputation on the line but in a way she is and and she said you need to check this out mm -hmm. so that was kind of the turning point for me and i sort of periodically would just sort of look into the subject but i would say probably in the last two years i got really interested in it and I would find more and more of these reports from, and again, I listen to the ones that I think are credible. Mm -hmm. Hey, you have to make a, a judgment call at some point. You, know, you do. It's like, you know, for me, it's like uh, I, with PacWest Bigfoot, I, I started it out as just kind of turning my own, you know, experience, my mom's experience and a friend or two of mine's experiences into kind of a campfire like stories. And that's what I do today. So you know, I just create these awesome campfire like stories out of, you know, experiences that people have or, you know, so called experiences. I don't do, you know, any sort of research into whether or not they're true or not. I'm not, not doing that. Um, yeah. I don't know how you validate me, whether somebody's. Uh, yeah. You can't validate it anyways. I, I can't validate yours. Yeah, <laughs> you can't right, validate exactly. mine, you know? Um, <laughs> well, and I have, honestly, I had to be my own skeptic on this and that's why yeah. I'm analytical and I sat down and I just started listing uh, the pros and cons. I think I even sent you a list of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've added a few things since, but I had to, um, sort of be my own harshest critic so that at the end of the day it I can say you know what um, that wasn't it or you know what I have eliminated everything that I can think of and I had and I was like this is it's a Bigfoot and that's why I contacted you and uh, um, to you know I want somebody else to come in who has some experience in this and I, I listened to your uh, you had two pretty significant uh, encounters. I mean, you had, <clears throat> didn't yeah, you guys? mine was pretty unmistakable that it was either a really big person or Bigfoot. I, I don't, you know, I didn't, there really wasn't much no ambiguity there. Yeah. Yeah. You had one of the, it's like a whistle in the woods. What whistles in the woods in Oregon? You got to yeah. think about the fauna, uh, yeah, the fauna that's out here in the in the woods. The, bears don't whistle. Coyotes can sound weird and harsh and crazy, but they don't no. whistle. No. It was as if somebody was standing, I would say, thirty or forty yards, and the area that we were at, like I said, if you on on one side, it went up, 
So you, you're going up the mountain there. And on the other side, it was a steep drop off going down towards this drainage down there. Mm -hmm. And that's the side that it came from. And it was probably 30 or 40 yards in there. So, you know, um, close, very close, mm -hmm. very light. And also, if you get too deep into the woods, sound doesn't carry. You know, it's going to yeah, get no. blocked even by dead trees. So it was very close. And you have to say, well, A, what was it? And then the other thing is the behavior, why? Why are you whistling? I don't think he's talking to us. I think he's talking. Yeah. I think it was signaling uh, others that are notoriously stealthy. <laughs> <laughs> but, exactly. Uh, yeah, so your encounter, I think, didn't you and your mom or your mom, I listened to yours some time ago, your mom actually saw, didn't she see like a giant footprint and she just stared at uh, it? It was, it was both of us. We had seen, uh, uh, she's the one that saw it first and they just kind of came, I'll turn my camera back on so you guys can see me. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you have, um, it's up towards Elderberry Flats. Anybody in Southern Oregon would know where that's at, pretty much up, up back out of Gold Hill and Sam's Valley up out, the, out back of Rogue River. Yeah, why do they call it flats? I have no idea because it ain't that dang flat out there. <laughs> <laughs> but you have like some old logging roads up in there where they'd go up in the mountains, pull the timber, bring it down. And then you had these big like you cross over these little like little creeks here and then you got the big, you know, uh, creek, it's Evans Creek, yeah. whatever that creek right. is back there. And and uh, but you you kind of go over this little you know concrete dirt kind of thing, and you're in this big rounded area here, you know where the trucks could turn around. Oh, okay. Right. And um, we parked there. It's you know first week of December, first weekend of December. We're gonna get our Christmas trees. There's snow on the ground up there. Yeah. Like, you know, bad. I mean, we got up there with our Dotson 210, you know, hatchback back. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. still out of date even then. Uh, yeah, we were the poke kids in Titan. Um, <laughs> awesome. Best kind um, of people. <laughs> so, um, uh, we, my, my, my dad and my brother and my sister kind of went walking off this way and you've got, it's kind of edged by mountain right there. So you're not walking up this, you're going to kind of walk up like this over that way. And there's yeah. a road here. It's just ditch. The road actually goes up around this way, around this, this mountain here, it goes up around it at an angle. I mean, it goes up pretty, pretty, and then it turns sharply, but over to the side of the road is like, you know, 30, 40 yards of just openness. And then it's just, walled with trees thicker than the ones we see here smaller but thicker yeah right, right you know i mean it's just a thick wall of trees you can't see in there and it's early morning and you still can't see in there on a partly cloudy day it, it was just it was just thick uh-huh and Sounds like you're it's, it's yeah. <laughs> my mom goes walking up there and just before the bend she's looking she's kind of looking around for some trees and all of a sudden i see her she's just looking at the ground she looks the trees and she looks back at the ground she looks She's all, she tells me, hey, come here, come here, check this out. And so I'm looking at them, and I'm trying to, you know, from heel to toe, I'm doing the splits, and I'm about 13 at the time, and I'm a short guy, but still, that's, that's pretty big distance for a guy at the time that was like, you know, four foot nine, you know, four ten, you know, going from heel to toe to the other, doing the complete splits. I mean, oh, you were doing I should have been a gymnast, yeah. Oh, this thing is, so you saw more than one track then? Oh, no, they, they came out of the woods along the side of the, the, the road down to the creek and then shot back up at an angle. And oh, they, were, wow. they, were, they were like this, but they were like one right in front of the other, but they just, they just kind of went like that and right down the so road. It's like it came out of the tree line. Took a look, <clears> yeah, and back then, you know, there's no such thing as cell phones or anything like that. I mean, there was, but they were about this big and they were only for people in New York City. Yeah, I remember um, that. And, you know, my mom, she just, she looks back at the woods again and looks at the tracks and looks at the woods and she just starts screaming for my dad or something or other and just starts screaming and <laughs> leaves me behind to be like Bigfoot fodder food or something. Yeah, that cracked me yeah. up, that part. I was like, what are you doing, woman? You're my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to protect me, yeah. Yeah, today I still hold that against her. She's all, can, yeah, I, have you're on your own. Yeah, can I have a PacWest Bigfoot hoodie? I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, just like everybody else, Ma. No, all right, of course, I, of course ask, I gave my mother a hoodie. Is that mug? Huh? Is that a PacWest mug? 
Yeah, what is that? Bigfoot. Yeah. Body. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, those are pretty cool. <clears throat> but yeah, thanks, Tom, for being on here and stick around for just a moment. <clears throat> um, I want to say thank you guys so very much for being on here and uh, putting up with my coffee slurping, allergy ridden you know, <laughs> stories here online. Um, glad you guys are enjoying them. If you want to grab some coffee mugs, grab some hoodies, grab some t-shirts. I got this one. These are the new uh, campfire one kind of campfire like ones that I really enjoy. <clears throat> so you can grab one of those. I love this one. I don't know about you guys, but I love this. I like it. So anyways, all right, enough of that. Thank you guys very much for being here. Pack West Bigfoot. God bless you guys. And I will see you the next encounter story.